Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Yingling. We have a very difficult task. Uh, but since today is Friday, uh, and more importantly, uh, our speakers uh, from morning until the afternoon, so we have Mike especially, as well as Stacy, uh, giving excellent points and excellent uh, um, thoughts on uh, coverage of all metrics. I feel uh, that uh, we could uh, really use this time to further expand on uh, those points which are all excellent and this is also a time for all of you to uh, to ask questions so this is your session too so so please feel free to post questions after we have uh, perhaps uh, you know gone through the initial uh, points about uh, op metrics uh, it is said by the Nobel uh, Laureate uh, Niels Bohr that prediction is difficult, especially if it is about the future. <laughs> so I'm glad that Yingling, in her wisdom, has chosen this uh, title of Metrics in the Year 2030. <laughs> uh, the good thing is that uh, all of us should still be around. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, <laughs> but we will still be back. Uh, <laughs> yeah. As long as we are all compost mentis. <laughs> and uh, we're going to look at a couple of very interesting angle, some of which already, uh, you know, are touched by Stacy and uh, Mike. Uh, and I would like to just get the ball rolling by getting uh, each one of the panel members to, to just very quickly in two to three minutes, just touch on what sort of changes you would expect in of metrics in the year 2030. <laughs> Assuming that we still have the colorful donut, <laughs> which uh, we all, I, which I quite like. So I hope the donut will still be there. Uh, so we shall start with Schubert. <laughs> the, 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 the one with the most white hair for time. <laughs> Uh, so and, 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 and of course I think I think just to help each one of the panel members, also feel free to share uh, what you what you expect or what you think could be some of the disruption that could occur in this sphere. What sort of disruptive uh, innovation that could uh, take place uh, in the tech world, technology world? that could supersede or subsume some of those technology that we, uh, we take for granted, like Twitter. Uh, so think about that and let your imagination run wild. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's no penalty for anything like that, you know. It, it, by, by 2030, we... <laughs> Okay, we, I was reminded, I scanned through the news today uh, about uh, the meeting in Davos, a certain big meeting in Davos, and uh, George Soros, uh, who is known for his outrageous uh, uh, prediction, uh, you know, made a few more predictions this year. Uh, and the reports said at the end that he's known to not have his prediction come true. <laughs> So, so that's, that's the thing about prediction, right? So not to worry, uh, feel free to share what you feel or what you believe are likely to take place uh, leading to the year 2030. 
Okay, so I, I hope I've given the panel member enough uh, lead already uh, with my rambling. <laughs> so, without uh, much delay, Schubert, shall we start with you? Thank you, Michael. You're giving me the hardest task <laughs> without time to think at uh, 4 o'clock on a Friday. <laughs> I can only tell you for sure I'm retired at that time. <laughs> Beyond that, I, I think <coughs> things like this, right? If you look at all these citation analysis and so on, the citation uh, landscape, uh, even the very mature landscape, I think the key thing is all about applicability. Whether, uh, it, are you getting anything yes. on the back? Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Now, even like today, we actually know that all these citation analysis where we get all your citation terms are much more relevant for certain fields of the behavior of all these different researchers. Right. So, for example, like STEM uh, kind of disciplines, citation comes with a lot of things because it's how the community practices. But if you look at things like arts and humanities, citation count doesn't mean too much. Right? But in, in, for example, today's NGU environment, uh, because of the way the top has decided how research should be appraised, they want all faculty, when they come to the promotion tenure exercise, to, to submit citation count numbers, regardless whether you're from humanities or social sciences. And the problem is that we have been trying very hard to, to explain to the top or the management who decided this is so, that some of these citation counts are much more applicable in some fields compared to other fields. Right? But because they decided to still have a blanket rule, uh, so everybody needs to create citation counts, even for our good friends in humanities. <coughs> And some of my, my, my colleague in here last week came to me with, uh, with a, a very sad face, a very concerned face, to say that uh, a, a professor whose name of course I cannot reveal wanted, to, wanted her to sit next to him to try to find ways to produce more evidence to increase the citation count because uh, the humanities scholar, his numbers in Google Scholar Web of Science corpus is extremely low. And if you're going for a full prof promotion, if your citation counts are low, it doesn't look a very good number to be a case put up for. So he was trying to get her to sit next to her, to look for things not captured by Google Scholar, just to add a plus one here, a plus one there. And I can tell you, even before the exercise is done, even if you sit there for six hours, at most you get is three to five percent more citation counts. It's going to still be very low in two, a two-digit number. It's not going to jump to five-digit number, that's for sure. Right? Likewise, when we talk about op matrix, Whatever happens in 30 years from now, or 2030, my feeling is that it will apply again more appropriately to certain disciplines. Other disciplines will not see op matrix as something very useful for them, simply because of the way the mechanics works in the different disciplines. Like we said earlier, some op matrix are much more usable now, are much more uh, common, commonly used in med medical, uh, biochemistry and things like that. I think there's a lot of such discussions because this is how the community behaves. And if you want the community to change, a lot will depend on whether it's a free flow for them to change, or is it something institutionalized by the top. If the top wants something to happen, then I will say that's the best impetus for change. Because you have no choice. As part of your submission to get promoted, tenure, and so on, you have to produce all matrix. If that is required, then all of us will find ways, because this is bread and butter for us. If we cannot produce good numbers to get promoted, then our career is, is at stake. If the top decides to do that, then I would say there's a good chance for the whole matrix uh, uh, aspect to be really considered as something very important. But of course, before they do that, they need to understand the sort of challenges of hot matrix. How easy it is to gain hot matrix compared to how easy it is to gain the citation counts. Of course, in all disciplines, there's always gaming involved. And the question is, how do we tackle this issue? Right? And, and I think that these are the things that we need to grapple with even before we're able to make any predictions. If you ask me, hot matrix will be there. Whether, whether it's generated by humans, where all, all your tweets and all your Facebook is produced, or by machines, and then the machines will then do their own analysis to assign you know, scores or points, I don't know. But for sure, I think they will be there. It's just how the community will embrace it, and how the behavior of this community has been driven by the decision makers up there who decides this is the way we're going to Decide what is your research impact, this is your research output, and so on. So that's my take on it. Very good. Every time. Thank you. Okay, thanks, uh, Thanks a lot. Um, okay, so, Edi, before we uh, you know, uh, go on to you, I also want to uh, say that uh, 
feel free to share your wish list as well for all metrics, right? Uh, what you wish uh, to happen by the year 2030. But not necessarily just what you expect the technology to be or the practice to be and something. But before that, I uh, don't want to echo what Schubert has shared because what he just shared is is truly the crux of the struggle that's going on right now in practically all universities. There's nothing wrong with the matrix. In fact, uh, uh, the matrix are, are, are neutral in, in their self. They are information. Uh, the danger is uh, the people using this information uh, in an uh, incorrect way, in an incomplete way, <coughs> And sometimes uh, in in a wrong way, yeah. uh, and that really is a very big big concern. Uh, and I would encourage all of you to look up the Leiden Manifesto because I feel that uh, Paul Waters and and others, Diane Higgs, have put out some very um, sensible advice. Uh, on the use of metrics. And my wish actually is every <coughs> university president and provost uh, would read this, you know, and make it like, and, and maybe put this in a plug and they read before they sleep every night <laughs> <laughs> to remind them that this is the correct use of metrics because the incorrect use uh, would hurt. Uh, a lot of uh, really, really dedicated and excellent uh, researchers. So, with that, Edie. Thank you. <laughs> and Michael is, is absolutely right. It's very difficult to prophecy, especially about the future. And I'm reminded of this because about 30 years ago, I was in Singapore and I was asked to give a talk about the future of research publication. And I gave this talk, and my prediction for research publication was that in 30 years, all research publications would be totally digital and totally interactive with totally embedded software and data sets and with um, also interactive discussion and, and debate. And all of this would become part of the, the digital record for that publication. So I had this idea of this dynamic publication that would contain user data as well as, as author data. Well, we see how successful that prediction was. <laughs> so, um, so I'll try again. Um, I think um, at this point, Altmetrics is very coarse-grained. I think in many ways it, it's, it's a solution looking for a problem and that we haven't yet figured out what it does and what it's good for. So what I would like to see happen um, in, by 2030 is that Altmetrics becomes much more fine-grained, that um, we know what each altmetric is actually measuring, and that we can automatically extract that information <coughs> from the altmetrics, so that we have not, not perhaps more numbers, but those numbers are weighted in some way, and they have, they have real meaning. They tell us motivation, they tell us what, what this metric is saying about this particular usage. So that is where I would like to see all metrics go. Um, in terms of disruptions, I think uh, when we're talking about technology and privately held data, there are all sorts of possible disruptions. And you don't have to look very hard on the web, for instance, to find predictions from all kinds of experts on the, the, the demise of Twitter. I mean, there are many predictors who are saying that Twitter is not going to survive, that it is not a changing or evolving technology, it's a static technology, <laughs> that it's not making any money, and in a couple of years, perhaps, we won't see Twitter anymore. So, and we all know that technology companies rise and fall. Sometimes the first with an idea is not always the one who blasts out the others. Um, so I can imagine all kinds of disruptions in the electric landscape. Um, I'm certainly not wishing demise on any any of our presenters <laughs> <laughs> here today. Certainly, I would hope well. not. <laughs> but um, it, we do need to recognize that, yes. that, especially when we have privately held data, that it is a real risk of major disruption. Thank you very much. I'm reminded uh, by one of the prediction that George Soros said at this year's meeting in the boss 
that the days of Facebook and Google are numbered. <laughs> So good, thank you for, for that. And, and another thing about prediction, uh, Edi, is that if you repeat the, those predictions uh, long enough, they will come true. <laughs> Eventually, you, know, you just got to live long enough to make sure that your prediction you know, eventually comes true. You know, we just have to have... Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, over to you, Na. Okay, so... Uh, I seem to we still don't know true meaning of the ultimate trees. So, uh, in general, we said the citations count is a meaning of the, some research impact of research article. Right. And then the ultimate trees may be the social impact of research article. But the question is whether actually the ultimate trees really mean the social impact. So how we can measure the social impact using the ultimetrics? So up to now, we only have a number, but uh, we don't know what kind of community are impacted by the social media. And also, we don't know how the count, actually count means a lot, but uh, how the, the research are impacted yeah certain community, yeah. how information are flow That's right. across uh, various communities. Mm -hmm. so, so since we don't know that kind of thing, so I think some other speakers also mentioned that we need to understand more about the meaning of the ultimate So especially through the content analysis. There so is. I think the motivation analysis is uh, important and some, some other the speaker mentioned about the motivation, why the uh, people are uh, mentioning research articles, so it's a motivation. So we don't know, so generally we need to understand the motivation. Very and then the sentiment is also one of the trends we need to understand. The, based on my small study, there's not many negative sentiment of the article when they share the, the research article, but the, we never know so in the future maybe people can be more critical. So more sentiment analysis can be more useful cool. and, and the other thing can be also need to explore for that. So in the two twenty thirty maybe we may better understand the true meaning of the ultimate tricks I hope. Very good. Thank you so much. I I, I share this as well. Uh, uh, this wish, I think it's more of a wish that by 2030 uh, there will be less numbers, fewer numbers, but more insight into uh, those uh, pu publications. Good. Now to Mike. Please. So, uh, I'm also um, very poor at making predictions. My, uh, <laughs> my favorite prediction was uh, of the past. I managed to, I saw Microsoft Windows for the first time and I said very loudly to everyone, this will never work. This will never work. <laughs> <laughs> so I won't try to make predictions for alt metrics, but maybe some uh, a wish list for alt metrics. So, so I'd like to see alt metrics more personalized to both the, the publication and the individual. So we know about the, the differences between fields in the um, average citation rates. So it, it would be good if alt metrics would be automatically tailored to the, the field in which they came from. So you would have a score which was already, which didn't tell you the number of tweets you got, or maybe it did tell you the number of tweets that you got, but also gave you a, a normalized figure, which would take into account uh, the field that you published in, uh, I know that's really a, a tricky a tricky thing to do because most research nowadays doesn't really fit narrowly in one field. So information science research, maybe it's a bit of library studies, a bit of computer science, maybe a bit of sociology. So most papers I think nowadays fit into more than one field uh, to some extent. So I think it's quite tricky, tricky to uh, categorise uh, an article by field and therefore field normalizer. Yeah. And also, maybe um, an article 
can contribute to other fields. You might publish a fairly pure article, but it's targeted at um, many different other fields that might use it. So statistics articles sometimes get used in many other, many different fields, for example. Mm -hmm. So if the, the altmetrics could take that into account, that'd be great. And for the, at the level of individual academics, if we produce uh, altmetric, overall altmetric scores for academics, then it would be fantastic if these could take into account the, the type of academic that they're for. So the age of the academic, so if you're old, hello, you, uh, <laughs> yeah. you, 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 have, you have to, I'm sorry, you have to have a penalty. If you're old, you have to have a penalty. <laughs> because you've had much longer to attract all these, um, all, all the altmetrics and the citations. So it's not fair to compare uh, the altmetrics of uh, someone who's spent ages doing, a lot, many years doing research with a, with a, a PhD student. And, and that's a really difficult problem uh, to solve as well, I think. And you have to take into account the fact that um, we're researchers are uh, human beings as well, surprise. <laughs> and um, that means that some of us have two jobs. Maybe we're part-time researchers, and maybe we're part-time carers, or maybe we're part-time uh, doing a, a different job. Maybe we work in the library part-time, uh, teach part-time. Uh, maybe we take career breaks to look after children or look after elderly parents, and if we use measures like the, the H-index to compare researchers um, and we don't take into that into account and that's not fair as well so we should have um, of metrics that are fair if they're used to compare people um, and fair in terms of their other contributions to society um, and, the, and the, the life situation and that's a really difficult issue because for that to work well you need to know really personal information about people and I don't know how that can be solved, so we don't really want public and personal information to be made public, but on the other hand, if that doesn't happen, then we won't get fair comparisons between people. And also another tricky challenge, I think, is to compare, is to normalise for the, the country that you come from. Um, so if you come from some countries, you'll have much, much fewer resources, many fewer resources to help you, and I think that should be taken into account. So uh, if you publish a similarly good quality paper from one country, that represents a much bigger achievement than if you publish that same paper from another country. So in terms of the, um, the level of achievement, then maybe, maybe we should normalise the country as well. Maybe even the university, I don't know. That would be very controversial. <laughs> <laughs> and then a final wish list thing, I think it, it would be interesting to see if from a different perspective, if we can really understand um, how communication works in um, academia and society in terms of knowledge by using all these different art metrics to track the flow of ideas from the production and turning into some kind of publication um, to having some use in society and see if we can really track how that happens. And I think that's going to be really tricky. We, maybe we need more more measurements, more indicators for that to uh, try to capture more of the different ways in which research can be used. Very good. So thank you very much. You know, I, I, I like particularly the point uh, raised about uh, the normalization and also that uh, with research becoming increasingly multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, uh, a, a piece of work could be well received, say, a, a, a paper in materials uh, and happen to be more on material chemistry, may be more appreciated by people in chemistry than uh, in metallurgy or in, phys uh, in, in physics for, for a matter. And uh, what I like uh, with uh, the site score is that you are able to actually go to different uh, uh, fields and, and see where your paper sits, you know, in terms of the percentile, that's, that's one of them. Um, the other one is that uh, with the, because every researcher wants their research to be uh, treated and viewed as specialized as possible, it is not possible with the topics, the, the 10,000, no, the 100,000 topics, am I right? The 100,000 topics that you can find inside there now. So perhaps that is an extension 
for all metrics to, to go into there and see in terms of the tweets or in terms of the uh, readership and others, how, how do the rest of the papers in the particular topic whether it's topic 978 or 1032, a stand, that kind of thing. Good, so thanks for that. Now we come to Stacey. <laughs> I also have a terrible futurist story. Uh, I'm more expensive, I think, than uh, you both. I was once asked uh, in 2009, uh, with whether my friends who had money to invest, whether I should invest in, or they should invest in Amazon.com with the launch of the Kindle. <laughs> and I said, oh, absolutely not. People won't stand for, for a company knowing that much about your reading habits. <laughs> so we're, we're, we'll, we'll create a group and you all can do the opposite of what we could have. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, anyway, okay. so in terms of uh, some of the disruptive technologies, so I think one issue will be encryption. And we're already starting to see this uh, in all metrics. Uh, one of the reasons that we had to, or we get asked about um, whether we can index WhatsApp messages and also, um, the name is totally escaping me right now. It's like the biggest social network in the world, and it, the Chinese social network. Yeah. We, oh, WeChat. 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 Yes, yeah. I can't believe I couldn't remember that. I was only thinking Sino Weibo. Um, but <laughs> we get asked that all the time. That would yeah. be incredibly important to know. But because the messages are encrypted, there's no way for uh, third-party services like Altmetric to be able to index those conversations because we can't track them. And I think over time, to, uh, more and more communications online will become encrypted and become private between the two people who are conversing, or maybe the groups of people who are conversing. And so that's going to make it much more difficult for companies like us to track conversations around research in as much depth as we'd like to. Uh, so that's one kind of ominous prediction for the field. Another uh, disruptor is just how machine learning is going to affect everything. Um, I was watching this really scary, depressing uh, TED talk by a uh, professor at uh, the iSchool at the University of North Carolina, and she was talking about um, how machine learning is really uh, in the field of big data, you know, big data in terms of commercial applications specifically. We're now at the point where we humans don't know uh, how these machines, uh, the computers, come to certain conclusions about the uh, predictors for criminal or potential uh, criminals and criminality, uh, predictions on uh, stock prices and so on. Uh, the algorithms are just so complicated and the machines, uh, are, the algorithms are constantly evolving that we just simply can't understand it anymore. If we were to try to look at the data ourselves and understand how this algorithm or this program came to a certain conclusion. And so I think that's going to be a challenge too as we start to integrate machine learning more and more uh, into altmetrics analysis. That we'll be making predictions based on uh, this big data that we have available at our fingertips, so long as it's publicly available data, not all encrypted, um, that it's going to be really, really difficult for us to understand, us mere humans to understand, how certain predictions are made uh, and certain trends are discovered uh, in terms of how research is discussed online. So those are two of the more ominous things uh, that I think the future holds. Um, again, take this all, like, do the opposite of what I say, because I'm terrible for the future. Um, some more, uh, I guess my wish list, my two wish list items. One is um, for changes in research evaluation to become much more uh, bottom-up, and for researchers themselves to be empowered through faculty unions and other types of uh, faculty organizations in order to uh, make declarations for themselves about how they do and do not want to be evaluated based on metrics. We've started to see this uh, at Indiana University in the States, Cassidy Subimoto uh, it was the head of the Indiana University faculty union a few years back and got together and got them to pass. And if you know anything about IU's faculty union, much like other faculty unions, it's just a lot of arguing and nobody ever manages to get anything done because we try to get a bunch of academics to agree on anything, it's impossible. Um, but in this case, she got them to adopt a responsible metrics kind of manifesto for the university that they put before the provost and said, if you're going to use metrics, and even new metrics like all metrics to judge us, you need to do it according to this. Mm -hmm. um, and so I hope to see more kind of ground up faculty-led initiatives like that. 
the other wish list item that I have, and then I'll pass the mic on, uh, is that we start to move away uh, from this scarcity mentality within academia and this idea that we all need to 